Hi there everybody, this is Bruce again and welcome to our third lesson in our series on the introduction to electric current. So far we have learnt that the flow of charge is called electric current and is measured as the rate of flow of charged particles through a conductor. Let us look at a simple animation to illustrate the flow of charge through a conductor. When the switch is open, no charge is able to flow through the conductor. But when the switch is closed, the cell pushes the charge around the circuit. This happens because there is a continuous path of metal wire for the electric current to pass through. The flowing electrical charge carries energy to all the working parts of the circuit. In this simple apparatus, which contains a light bulb and a conducting lead, we have conducting material which contains charges. Although it's in a loop formation and resembles an electrical circuit, we can see that the bulb is failing to be lit up. In other words, the charge is unable to flow. In today's lesson, we will learn what is necessary to be able to make charge flow. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how current is maintained in a conductor, describe the direction of electric current, and be able to measure current using an ammeter. Electrical current is the continuous flow of charge through a conducting material, for example, copper wire. Now the charge carriers are the electrons but they are invisible to the naked eye. We are going to have to use something that will allow us to describe the flow of these electrons in some simple way. The method that we are going to use is by looking at the concept of flowing water. Let's compare the electric current with water being pumped from a reservoir through a pipe to a waterfall and back through pipes and into the reservoir again. When water flows through a pipe, or down a stream, there is a current, that is to say, a flow of water. Let us now look at a graphical representation of this comparison. This mechanical system consists of a pump pushing water through a closed loop. Let's suppose that the electrical current is comparable to the water flowing through the system, then the following parts of the two systems would be related. The pipe is the equivalent of the wire in the electric circuit, the pump is the mechanical equivalent of the battery. The waterfall is equivalent to the light bulb. So the work done by the pump, pushing water from the reservoir up through the pipes and back to the reservoir, is like the energy generated by the battery to drive the charge through the circuit. The water flows down the waterfall, transferring its gravitational energy in the same way as the electric current passes through the light bulb, transferring electrical energy. Materials that allow electrical charge to flow through them are called conductors. Substances like gold, copper, graphite and aluminium are all good conductors of electrical charge, while rubber, plastic and wood are poor conductors. They are known as insulators. Insulators have a high resistance to the flow of electrical charge through them. Charge does not flow through good insulators as it does through good conductors, which is why the wires you plug into a wall socket are covered with a protective plastic coating. Plastic is a good insulator. Charge flows through the wire, but not through the plastic coating to you. Some materials like silicon and germanium are semiconductors. They are used to make microchips and only conduct electricity under specific conditions. So materials can be divided up into three categories, depending on the ease at which they allow electrical charge to flow through them. These are conductors which pass current easily under all conditions, semiconductors only under special conditions, and insulators which never conduct electrical current. Now let us concentrate on our first objective for this lesson, which is understanding how electrical current is maintained in a conductor. In other words, what is needed to allow electrical charge to flow? Let us look at our earlier comparison once more. We said that the pump is the mechanical equivalent for the battery. 
Notice how the pump pushes the water through the pipe and around the circuit. When the pump is not working, the waterfall dries up and the water no longer flows over it. So no work is done in the water circuit. No energy is transferred. Now how does this relate to electrical circuits? Similarly, in our electric circuit, we need a source of electrical energy for electrical charge to flow through the circuit. Without the source of electrical energy, no work is done and electrical energy cannot be transferred to other forms. There are quite a few sources of electrical energy we could use. A torch cell, a car battery or a dynamo. We could even use a photovoltaic cell which transfers light energy into electrical energy. Now why do we need a constant source of this energy? And what would happen if we had to stop supplying electrical energy? You can see that without the battery of cells being connected, no charge can flow in the circuit. So a constant supply of electrical energy is necessary to maintain a current in a circuit. A cell provides energy to the charge carriers, which is then used to transfer energy to the various components within an electrical circuit, for example, to a light bulb. It is thus the chemical reaction inside the cell which produces the electrical energy which is transferred as heat and light within the light bulb. I have now set up a very simple electrochemical cell to try and illustrate the chemical processes that take place within the cell to provide that electrical energy. This is the simple electrochemical cell which is going to illustrate how the chemical reactions within a torch cell provide electrical energy. It is made up of a rod of zinc metal and another rod of copper metal. The zinc rod is placed in a solution of zinc ions in this beaker and the copper rod is placed in a solution of copper ions in this beaker over here. A U-tube containing a chemical solution now links the two beakers together. This is the digital multimeter which I'm going to connect to my simple electrochemical cell to prove to you that the chemical reaction is producing electrical energy. If we are getting electrical energy being produced, then we will get a reading on this little display at the top of the multimeter. Here I've placed the digital multimeter into the electrochemical circuit. I'm now going to complete the circuit by attaching the probe to this clip. And you'll see that there is now a reading on the liquid crystal display. The reading now proves to us that electrical energy has been produced by the chemical reactions inside the electrochemical cell. Chemical reactions inside the electrochemical cell result in a transfer of electrons from the zinc to the copper and in so doing produces electrical energy. Let's see how this now compares to the torch cell in our electrical circuit. The torch cell as you can see in front of you, acts as the source of electrical energy and replaces the energy of the charge carriers as they pass through it. The torch cell pumps out energized charges at the positive terminal indicated at this end of the cell and receives unenergetic charges at the negative terminal at the other end of the cell. Therefore we can say that the function of the cell is to energize the electrical charge that passes through it. To maintain a current in a conductor, the following is needed. A source of electrical energy which provides energized charge and a closed circuit which provides a continuous path for charge to flow along. So let's take a moment to find out a little bit about the history of the early experiments using electric current. The first person to investigate electric current was Michael Faraday during the early 19th century. He carried out many experiments using the newly designed cells made by Luigi Galvani and Alessandro Volta and he wrote scientific papers describing his findings. When Faraday experimented with the cells created by Galvani and Volta, no one really knew in which direction the electrical charges flowed. It became the convention or the accepted way to regard electrical current as the flow of positive charge from the positive terminal of the cell to the negative terminal. 
we still use the conventional direction when marking currents on circuit diagrams. We adopt this convention to honour the work of the great Michael Faraday. You have to learn the direction of conventional flow, so please make sure that you write it down. The direction of electric current is the direction of flow of positive charge through a conductor. Now let's look at what symbol is given to electric current. Note that the electric current is given the symbol capital I. Capital I always implies that the direction of the current is in the direction of flow of positive charge. And finally, how do we measure electric current? What instrument do we use? And what are the units of electric current? We measure electric current with an instrument called an ammeter. The unit of current is the ampere, which has a symbol capital A. So if the ammeter reads 1 ampere, that means that the current at that point in the circuit is equal to 1 ampere. Charge is measured in coulombs, so therefore 1 ampere is equal to 1 coulomb per second. Let's go back to our electric circuit, and I will connect the ammeter into the circuit to measure the amount of current passing through a light bulb. Here is now my ammeter placed into my electrical circuit. Again to remind you, there are my connecting leads to place the ammeter in series with the light bulb in the circuit. I will now close the switch and notice what happens to the needle on the ammeter. Here you can see that the ammeter is reading the current through the electrical circuit. I am using the 1 ampere scale at the top, which means that our needle is sitting at approximately 0,32 amperes. So what does this reading actually mean? Well, it tells us that 0,31 amperes is the current passing through the light bulb. Therefore, it must be the amount of charge passing through the bulb. So we know that there's 0,31 coulombs of charge passing through in every second. That's all we have time for in this lesson. In our next lesson, we'll be learning more about conductors and insulators. Until then, goodbye for now. Yeah.